My wife and I were up in Amish country recently, and they like ride horses and buggies. Have you ever been stuck? Anyone ever been in traffic with horses and buggies around you? Kind of a fun thing. Um, a while back, heard the story of an Amish couple that made their way into the big city, and you know they had never seen any of this kind of stuff because they had always, you know, they they don't do any of the modern technology, so they ride horses and buggies and um, nothing that would be you know newer innovations. And so they were going to go stay at a hotel, and they walk up the hotel to um, kind of get checked in, and they'd never seen anything like all the stuff that they're seeing. Uh, They walk up to the front door. Of course, there's automatic doors. They opened up and the whole family is startled as the doors open and, uh, you know, don't really know what to think about this and, you know, kind of tentative, but sure enough, people are walking in and out. And so that the dad leaves the mother and some of the kids, he brings one of his sons with him and kind of makes his way in. uh, And they just see all these little things happening, you know, automatic coffee makers and all the, the, just all the things that modernity brings to the table. And so sure enough, he goes up to the, to the front desk and finds out, hey, you're going to be up there on the um, you know, the seventh floor or whatever, you know, take this little key, go up to the seventh floor and um, go over there. And so he kind of walks over there, which was to an elevator, of course, and he'd never seen, it has no idea what this is. And the elevator doors are kind of opening and closing. And sure enough, there's a, he was standing next to a, a much older lady, like a very old lady. And um, she kind of walked up and when she did, the doors to the elevator opened and the old lady walked into the elevator and he kind of stepped back and then the doors closed and he was startled and didn't know what happened to her. And, you know, about 30 seconds later, the doors open and this beautiful 25 year old <laughs> woman walks out and his eyes were big and they shut again. And he looks at his son. And he said, son, go get your mother. <laughs> now, now this is a day of transformation. And I'm not talking about superficial transformations, but I'm saying there's something inside of each one of us that I think we all know that there's something pretty shallow about if you're just looking at externals. But I think all of us know that deep down on the inside, we wish there was some door we could walk through where the deepest parts of us that are messed up would change. That the deepest parts of us that are that are stuck would get unstuck. That, that the areas of our life that have maybe been wrong for a very long time could somehow get, I'm not talking about my wife, I'm talking about in me. I'm saying in me, there's something in me that would like to be different than that. Today we're gonna look straight at the one thing that will stunt growth more than anything else, that will stop transformation more than anything else, that will cause people to not be changed more than anything else, that will bring, that will wreak havoc in marriages more than anything else, that will do worse things with children and their parents or roommates and their friends or coworkers and their bosses that will do, wreak more havoc than anything else, and that thing is called unforgiveness. So if you've got a Bible, go to Colossians 3 and stand your feet while we're going to read this. Colossians 3, we're going to start in verse 9. We're going to go down to verse 13, and that's where we're going to camp out. We've been memorizing this and studying this, Colossians 3, kind of going through it. And it says in verse 9, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. By the way, this is great news. This says right here that in Jesus, there's not white people and black people and brown people and purple people and Asian people and American people and gringos and non-gringos. In Jesus, there's just the people of God. I don't want to be in a church where I look around and everyone's the same as me. I don't want to have friends if all of your friends are exactly the same as you. That's not how it is in heaven. In the body of Christ, there's all these, the body of Christ, the, the, the church isn't supposed to be soup where you throw everything together and it all melts together. We're like a salad, man. There's crunches and colors and flavors and, and we're like God's salad for the world. It's really good for you. <laughs> Verse 12, put on then. In other words, because you are diverse, there's going to be challenges. You're going to have to put on God's, God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, Humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. Did you hear that, that phrase? Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Let's pray. God, I ask for help to say this like it should be said. And for us to hear it like it should be heard. Lord, I pray that you would do something in this place where prisoners are set free. 
and that your kingdom will come in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 You may have a seat. You know, we're talking about forgiveness today. And there could not be a harder topic to, to broach because some of the things that have happened to us are small things and, and perhaps petty. And for sure, part of this message is going to be addressed at, at a call to become less petty. But I also know that there are some of you that are listening to me now that have gone through unspeakable pain. And you've endured hardship that to even say it out loud would would perhaps be tormenting all over again. I'm sure there's hundreds of you that are listening right now, some of you that are joining us online, that some of you that are watching this right now, that, that the pain in your heart is so maybe even tender, and, and someone maybe lied to you and said that time heals wounds, and, and you could look them in the eyes and say, that is a lie, because a lot of time has gone by, and I'm certainly not healed, and time has passed, but things are certainly not better. And I, I just want to, on the front end, because this message is going to be a message saying that we've got to let things go and we do need to forgive. But I need to tell all of you on the front end right now that, that there's some things that happened to many of us in the room and, and it wasn't okay. I, 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 want, I, just, I want to let you know this. I want this space to be safe today. And I, and I need you to know that God is not saying everything is okay. Forgiveness is not a message where I'm going to be saying it was no big deal because there's some of you that know very, very well. It was a very, very big deal. And I'm sorry for that. I wish I, I wish I could go back and touch the point when it happened. I wish I could go back and undo. What I can say is that there is a hope today, and before we're done today, I believe we have a God who is going to manifest today. And I don't mean six months from now or six years from now, that today is a day of healing. And that today is a day of salvation. And that today is a day of a fresh start. And that today is a day that some of you that have maybe even been stuck for weeks, months, or years, today, I'm going to be like a Moses who said, let my people go in the name of Jesus. And that this is a day today that some of you that have been stuck are going to get unstuck. Here's the message today. Bitterness is bondage. Forgiveness is freedom. I want you to choose freedom. Bitterness is bondage. Forgiveness is freedom. I was reading this week in Johns Hopkins, a journal from Johns Hopkins, talking about the effects of unforgiveness. Johns Hopkins, this is just science. I'm not even preaching the Bible yet. This is just science. It says whether it's a simple spat with your spouse or a long-held resentment toward a family member or friend, unresolved conflict can go deeper than you realize and may be affecting your physical health. The good news, studies have found that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards in your physical health lowering the risk of heart attack, improving cholesterol levels in sleep, reducing pain, reducing blood pressure, reducing levels of anxiety, reducing depression and stress. And research points to an increase in the forgiveness, health, connection as you age. There's an enormous physical burden being hurt by being hurt and disappointed, they tell us. Chronic anger puts you into a fight or flight mode chronically, which results in numerous changes in heart rate, blood pressure, immune response. Those changes then increase the risk of depression, heart disease, diabetes, among other conditions. Forgiveness, however, calms stress levels leading to improved health. Another example where modern science agrees with what Jesus said 2,000 years ago. Forgive us our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Bitterness is bondage, which is why today I want to talk to the, to the real you. I like how it says here in verse 3, he says, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint. Now, I like this word complaint because sometimes you come to someone and say, hey man, you got some bitterness. And I hear this pushback from people when you talk about forgiveness because I hear people say, Mike, I could never forgive what they did to me. I will never forget what they have done. And if you cannot forget, how will you forgive? Because we've heard since childhood, forgive and forget. And I need you to know today that forgiveness 
is a lot of things, but forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting. Forgiveness does not mean I'm putting it out of my Forgiveness is not forgetting. And so I want to talk to the real you. There's some of us that might even say, well, I'm not, I'm not harboring unforgiveness. Well, what do you think about that? Well, I just, I just hold something against him. I want you to listen to that. I, I hold something against him. When you hear his name, what does it do to you? When you see her face, when you see her at the supermarket and, and she's on one side and you make your way to the other side because God knows you do not want to be in the same aisle as that little homo sapien. <laughs> it's, it's, as if, it's as if you got bit by a snake and you're now wearing the snake that bit you. Is that the plan? Some people say, well, it's not unforgiveness. It's, it's not bitterness. I, it's, it's just a complaint. I, I just have a few complaints against my boss. I've just got complaints against my wife. I've just got complaints against my second husband. I've, I've just got complaints against my third child. I, I've just got complaints against my coach. I, it's, it's not bitterness. I just have a lot of complaints. I love the fact that in verse 15 of Colossians 3, where we're talking about the new you, he says, forgiving each other. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Complaints require forgiveness. Hebrews 12, 15 says it like this. It says, um, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God because you can. Let's get clear. You can fail to obtain the grace of God. Well, God's just going to give everybody grace. Well, God gives everybody grace. He doesn't mean everyone's receiving grace. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness. Now, this is big because in this series, in fact, today's message is in some ways a culmination of all the messages up until now. Setting your mind on things above, not on things of earth. Unforgiveness is a setting of your mind on the things of earth, specifically things in the past. But we talked a few weeks ago. We said, you know, the key to life, it's not, don't just deal with, with fruit. You've got to take it all the way to the, remember this? Don't just deal with fruit. Get to the root. There is one root that's worse than all the other roots, in my opinion. It's the root of bitterness that springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many become defiled. When you are bitter, you defile your marriage. When you are bitter, you, de bitter, you defile your children. When you are bitter, you defile your department. When you are bitter, you defile your team. When you are bitter, you defile your friendships. When you are bitter, you defile your apartment co work you know, the, the people that you're living with, your, your, your uh, co cohabitants of your apartment complex. When you are bitter, everything you do may be sincere, but it's defiled. It's like getting an arrow, and the arrow gets twisted, and, and you try to shoot it. No matter how hard you try, the arrow always goes off because it's defiled. It's, it's twisted, and bitterness has a way of twisting you. And what's so wicked is it was done to you oftentimes. Your uncle doesn't deserve to own you for the rest of his life, but that's what you give him when you're bitter. The father that... They did things he should never have done, and I'm so sorry that he did. He doesn't deserve to own you for the rest of your life, but that's what you give him when you don't let go. Bitterness is bondage. It, it's especially, for, this is like an adult thing in particular. I mean, I've got eight children. Any of you that are new, I've got eight children. I know that children can get bitter. The thing about kids is they get bitter, then they get better. You ever seen that? Like a kid, they're fighting on, on Thursday, and they're like, I hate you. I hate you. I'll never forgive you. The next day, they're best friends. You ever seen that? But their mothers? Like, you know, little Johnny fights with little Timmy at school. They come home, they tell their moms, little Johnny and Timmy are better on Friday. But those two moms aren't going to talk for 30 years. <laughs> because adults have a hard time of burying the hatchets. They kind of put half the hatchet down, the hatchet hats, you know, the, the top still sticking out. They're, they're ready to go pull that back up anytime they need it. Bitterness is bondage because bitterness aligns us with hell. Let me make this clear. Heaven is the place of forgiveness. Hell is the place of unforgiveness. When you choose to live in unforgiveness, you are partnering with hell, not heaven. Heaven is the place where people go who have had their transgressions forgiven. Psalm 32, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sins are covered. Heaven is the place where people have received the forgiveness of God and they are giving the forgiveness of God. That's heaven. 
Hell is the place where people do not receive the forgiveness of God and they will not give the forgiveness of their hearts. When, listen, 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 when you choose, and you do, when you choose unforgiveness, you are choosing the kingdom of hell over the kingdom of heaven. It's God's job to get you to heaven when you die. It's your job to get heaven to earth while you live. And what I'm telling you is when you forgive, you bring the kingdom on the earth as it is in heaven. When you are bitter, you bring hell on your earth as it is in heaven. You get to choose what kingdom, which is what, which is what breaks my heart on this because things that were done to me, Satan then uses against me to reinforce his power over me. And I got to say today, that's enough, is enough, is enough. There's something about realizing, no, no, no more. I will not hold on to this any longer. Bitterness is bondage. Heaven is the realm of forgiveness, and hell is the realm of unforgiveness. And un- because, see, see, unforgiveness is wrath. Unforgiveness is where you say, wait a minute, you did something to me, so I am going to have wrath against you. I'm going to be angry against you. I'm, I, I, will, I am going to be the judge. Now, we know that the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith who? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. But are there any of you like me that are like, okay, Lord, vengeance is yours, but you know, but Lord, I would like to be your vessel to help carry this out. (laughs) Any of you ever prayed stuff like that? Any of you ever like had an enemy? You're like, let's say it was a sports team and and the team was like, I don't know, they had like ridiculous colors like purple and yellow and you, and there was something in you that, that you wanted vengeance and said, God, use me thy vessel. (laughs) You, You ever had moments where like you want the bad guys to get it stuck to them? Right? You're right? See, but here's, this is what, here's the problem with vengeance. What vengeance is, vengeance is where you say, God, you get off the throne. I'm going to stay on the throne because I don't trust either your competency or your timing to make things right. So you get off the throne. What's wild is when we do not forgive people, we align ourselves with Lucifer, who is the devil. Lucifer was an angel in heaven who would not submit to God. And the scripture tells us in the prophets, he said, I will ascend to become just like the most high. Satan's problem in heaven was that he wasn't God. Our problem with anger is that when we hold on to anger and bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness and offense, we kick God off the throne, repeating the promise problem that started the whole problem of all the problems when Satan said, God, get off the throne. I will ascend. And God says, no one's ascending higher than me. There is no God but God. When you hold on to unforgiveness, you put yourself into the position that the enemy put himself into at the beginning of all the drama. And you say, God, get the heck off my throne. I will be God and you shall not. Bitterness is bondage because it partners us with hell. By, by the way, I, I want to, I wanna, let me just, let me say something real quick because I don't want anyone to take this message today and send it to, like, let's say you did somebody wrong and they have not forgiven you. I don't want you sending this message to someone that you tormented, that you abused, that you molested, that you did something wrong to, and you're like, see, you got to forgive me. You know, let me say something to you real quick. If you're an abuser, tormentor, if you're one of those people, let me tell you what Jesus said. He said, offenses are going to come, but woe to those through whom they come. He said there are some people that make little ones to stumble. And he says if you are one of those, if you're one of those abusers, if you're a wolf, let me just say it clearly, man. He said better for a millstone to be thrown around your neck and be cast into the sea. You're going down. I want some of you to hear that because some of you that are holding on to bitterness because you're like, Mike, if I, don't, if I forgive these people, they're getting off. You believe me on this. They're not getting off. The judge is going to take care of them. You leave it in his hands. I need some of you to know that. There is a king on the throne and he is going to wipe out injustice. There is a king on the throne and he is going to make things right. There is a king on the throne and they thought they got away with it. They will not. If you're like, well, Mike, what about about me? I'm the one that did some of these things. I got one word, two words for you. Repent. (laughs) That's one word. (laughs) Two syllables. But you needed to smile, so I had to say it like that. There it was. You need to repent. That's what you need to do. If you repent, so much hope. But if you don't repent, whoa. Everyone say, well, bitterness is bondage, but, but some of you, I need, I need you to know, God's going to make things right. Number, you know, it's, bitterness is bondage, forgiveness is freedom. He says, forgiving one another, forgiving one another. Mike, I can't forgive because I don't feel it. Great, that's fine. Forgiveness is not a feeling. You don't have to feel it. You need to forgive your spouse. You don't have to be like, oh my gosh, I just felt it. Like a goosebump. It's like, woof, forgive. Like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Like, 
bless you. Oh, I forgive. Oh, my uncle that did horrible, unspeakable things to me? Oh, I just, I, I don't know. I, I went up to the, an altar and someone prayed over me. And I, I went and I listened to Joyce Meyer. I, I was listening to some TV preacher. And, and you know, someone did something. They, they just kind of touched me. You know, uh, I, I saw Benny Hinn on a plane and he sneezed. And when he sneezed, I was just like, oh, I feel it. I, I just forgive everything, right? No, forgiveness is not a feeling. By the way, is that good news? You don't have to feel it. You don't have to feel, uh, zero. You zero person have, Jesus was not on the cross when he was dying and he didn't feel anything but torment. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is not minimizing. Forgiveness is not saying it's all okay. What your uncle did, what your dad did, what your, what your co-worker did, what that first boss did, what that woman did, what that man did. That doesn't mean it's okay. It doesn't mean it was no big deal. It doesn't mean I'm validating that. It doesn't mean I'm accepting that. It doesn't mean I'm approving of that. Forgiveness is not approval. Forgiveness is not acceptance. Forgiveness is none of that. Let me tell you what else forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. I've heard some people say, I don't want to forgive my grandfather because there's no way I would let him come into my house with my children and do to his grandchildren what he did to me. Do to my grand, you know, do to his, you know, do to my, his great-grandchildren what he did to me. To which I would say, you need to understand that forgiveness is not reconciliation. You could actually forgive someone and when they say, am I welcome over for Thanksgiving? The answer is, you are not. <laughs> You, you could actually truly forgive somebody and you're never going to get in a car with them again because I want you to see the difference here. One kind of forgiveness, it's called unilateral, unilateral forgiveness. Unilateral forgiveness, bearing with one another, unilateral forgiveness is where you give forgiveness even if the person never asked for forgiveness. That's unilateral forgiveness. Unilateral forgiveness, it's one way, uni. That would be one-way forgiveness. The other kind of forgiveness is what they would call complete forgiveness. Complete forgiveness or bilateral forgiveness or two-way forgiveness or holistic forgiveness. That is what happens when somebody asks for forgiveness and someone gives forgiveness. In other words, I can offer someone forgiveness there is, you, there is bilateral forgiveness when that person is also repented. So let's just say your grandfather did, uh, was a terrible jerk in your life and he was always mean to you or whatever it is that he did. What happens is you need to forgive him no matter what, but reconciliation is only possible when someone repents. That's why, don't miss this, 2,000 years ago, Jesus forgave you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus already took care of you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus got it all worked out. But you don't get reconciled to God until you do what? repent. There can be no reconciliation until there is repentance. That's why unilateral forgiveness sets you free. That doesn't necessarily set them free until there has been repentance, which is why Jesus said, go preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. Now, there's a couple different, there's few different words in the Greek, in the Bible for forgiveness. One of them is, it's a word that's aphiemi. It means to, to send something away. So, for example, when we read uh, in the Lord's Prayer, that's not the one that's, that's here. In the Lord's Prayer, he says, uh, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer? Wave at me if you've ever prayed that prayer. In fact, could we pray it right now? Could we just say, Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Okay, do you realize how dangerous that prayer is? Do you, do you have any clue how dangerous? I know we pray that a million times. Do you know what you just prayed? Lord, treat me the way I treat my enemies. That's the Lord's prayer. Forgive us, forgive me, forgive us as we, as, as. Imagine if I said, Ruth, I want you to make me some flan as, one of the sisters in the church makes the best flan there, there ever is, you know, as Elaine makes it. I want you to make it like that, okay? That's, that's what I need you to do, as. Like, the, forgive us as we also have. In other words, Lord, treat me the way I treat my enemies. Did you know that's what you pray? Th that means, let's say you're married. Let's, let's, say, let's say a husband's mad at his wife and he's bitter. He's got complaints against his wife. So what does he do when he's got complaints? You ever seen a husband do this? Like, mm, you know, and she's like, hey, baby. And he's like, mm, hey, baby, everything okay? Mm, mm, mm. She's like, baby. Everybody's like, mm, 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 mm. 
And he's like, she's like, come on, baby. Like, are, are we good? She said, mm-hmm. she said, baby, you, you know I love. Mm-hmm. And she said, baby. She said, mm-hmm. okay, let, okay, let's just say that's how it goes down. <laughs> let's, let's say that's how you treat people. Well, you, you weren't unforgiving. You were just holding something against her. You just had a complaint. Could you imagine, since the scripture says, God is going to treat you the way you treat your enemies. Imagine if you came to church and you started trying to worship God and come near God and you're like, Lord, we lift you up and exalt you. And God's like, hmm, 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 hmm. And you're like, come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. Oh, my God, you will not delay your refuge and strength always. Jesus, make yourself near. He's like, hmm, hmm, hmm. You're like, you know, Jesus, we love you. We love you. We come into your presence with thanksgiving. Hmm, hmm. Lord, let's do sort of, come on, a little bit longer. Let's go to the fourth song now. Sing it again. If we just keep singing it again, let's sing that song again one more time because the Lord's in a bad mood and we need to get him in a good mood now. And he's finally like, well, okay, little children, come unto me. All you who are weary, let's go. (laughs) Now, we know that's ridiculous and we know it's as petty as could be and yet we know God doesn't change, but you do. But here's what happens. God is going to allow you to feel him, to experience him, to encounter him in the same way as you, you are going to get treated with the measure that you use. So if you give people a tight, wad, petty mm, 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 measure, what's going to happen is your relationship, your relationships, but especially with God, you're going to feel the same thing. Bitterness is bondage. Forgiveness is freedom. It's interesting. The, the Greek word here, it, it's, it's karisomai. Karisomai. It's, it's from the Greek word charis, which means grace, which means a free gift. It's where we get the words like we are saved by grace through faith. It's where we get words like charismatic. It's freely given. I'm going to read you a story out of Luke in Luke chapter 7. Just a kind of a lengthy story to make this very clear, but I want you to hear it because it's amazing and it's incredible. And it's, it's the one time Jesus uses this word. Jesus uses this Greek word once. It's not the most often used word, but it is the one that's used here. Starting in verse 36, it says, One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at table. And behold, there was a woman of the city who was a sinner. That means she, that means she was really living a rough life rebellious life. When she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now, just to give you perspective, Middle East, 2,000 years ago, feet stink, hairy Jewish toes, leather sandals, it's kind of gross, which means to go indoors, the only way to kind of keep it appropriate and not embarrassing is you would take off your shoes and someone would wash feet. It was like a minimum wage kind of job, sort of a, I don't know, like a, a lower kind of thing. But it was, it was traditional that the feast giver would provide this for any special guest in his house. So to not give that to someone, it's a little bit of a slight, but this woman sees Jesus, sees his dirty, nasty feet, and she produces so many tears that the, the volume of her tears washes the grime of Jesus' feet. And the only glorious thing she may have had, which would have been her hair, Scripture would talk about a woman's hair was her glory. She dries it and washes it, scrubs it with her hair. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known what sort of woman this was that's touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, say it, teacher. He said, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and another 50. Ten times in one-tenth. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt. Now, here's the word. This is that kerizomai. It's charis. He kerizomaid. He, he canceled. In, in ESV, it gets translated canceled. In other places, it gets translated forgiven. This is what forgiveness is. It's not a feeling. It's not, oh, I don't want that money. I don't even want that money. Oh, you don't even know. It's, it's not denial. It's not denying the 500 denarii. It's not denying the 50 denarii. That's not what it is. It's a canceling. It's saying, I no longer hold this note against you. I hereby cancel this note. He canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? 
Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, which by the way was another traditional thing. And even in cultures right now, even men would go and kiss someone else. Any Hispanics in the room, you know what it is. You, you give a, it's a cultural kiss. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she hasn't ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many. I don't know if you guys can understand how much this would mean to a woman. Her sins, which are many. Can you imagine what it's like when the king of the universe says over you, they're forgiven. And how he uses that other word, F-E-M-E, it means to, to send away. I'm taking her sins and I'm sending them away. Forgiveness is a canceling. I no longer hold this and it's a sending it away. Her sins which are many. He's, he's not saying they weren't sin. He's not saying it was not a big deal. Forgiveness is not saying it was okay. It is not saying it was not a big deal. There were some things done to you that were a very big deal. What I'm saying is today is the day to send it away. This is the day that some of you that have not been able to breathe in years are going to catch your breath again because you're going to send it away. In microchurches, help each other. Send it away. Forgive us our debts. Sometimes I need help to even forgive other people's debts. Some of you might even need help today to have someone come alongside you and say, we're going to send this away. I tell you, her sins, which are many. And man, there's some of you that are listening to me now, some of you watching online, some of you that are in this room right now that your sins are many. And today, you are going to know what it's like to be forgiven because of the grace of Jesus, because of the mercy of Jesus, because of the power of Jesus. And it doesn't matter what any Simons of the world think about you, what any Pharisees of the world, you might have walked in a sinful man or woman, and you're going to walk out forgiven. Blessed be the Lord. <laughs> and he said to her, your sins are forgiven. He said to her, he's going to say to some of you today in your heart, your sins are forgiven. Some of you that have been so guilty, you can't get past it. A guilty conscience. Today, today, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you will come to Jesus today, he will change you. If you will come to Jesus today, he will forgive you. If you will come to Jesus today, he will clean you. If you will come to Jesus today, he will transform you. If you will come to Jesus today, you will never be the same. Never. <laughs> it's incredible. All he has to do is say it. Let there be light. And there's like universes. And I don't care how big your load of sins is. All he has to do is say, your sins are forgiven. And bam, light shines. Oh, it's that easy? No, it took a cross. It took a bloody cross and an empty tomb. But he knows how to pull it off. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? I'll tell you who he is. He's the Lord of all the lords, and he's the king of all the kings. He's the redeemer of all the redeemers. He's the father of all the fathers, and he is the restorer of all the broken. And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say to some of you today. Your faith is going to save you. Now go in peace. And you're going to walk out. You came in without. You're going to go out with peace. Bitterness is bondage. Forgiveness is freedom. But the key to forgiveness, and this is where I'm, this is the last, this is really the big idea. The key to forgiveness, and this is why the key to forgiveness is not forgetting what they did, it's remembering what God did. Forgiving them, says in verse 13, bearing with one another, if one has a complaint, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, as the Lord has forgiven you. It's the consistent teaching of scripture, as the Lord has forgiven you. Forgive each other. There's always this pause, like, I can't. He says, as the Lord has forgiven you, oh, that's right. There's this reminder, wait, you've been forgiven, that's right. Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Well, I could never forget. No, you don't have to forget, which is why forgiveness doesn't require forgetting. What it requires is remembering. It's like this. In the sermon that we did on the, 
on the mind, on the setting of your mind, there was this reality that there's things that happen to us. So there's stuff that could just kind of happen to us, and it kind of burns something in us. Now, if we just let it go, if we could let the thought, you see porn for the first time, if you could let it go, it'd be all right. You get tempted, if you could just let it go. But remember, there's these neurological pathways that when we rehearse it in our minds, when we say it again with our mouths, when we go there again in conversation, when we keep regurgitating it again, when we keep on thinking on that again and again and again, and I'm not saying we don't go there. What I'm saying is something happens where we kind of, we burn some agreements in there and there's these little neural pathways that begin to define us. These neural pathways and what will happen is a lot of us think that forgiveness means I need to get to the place where I have forgotten all this stuff but what we find is that you cannot actually just get rid of the wrong neurological pathways. But while you cannot forget them and you cannot erase the old neurological pathways, scientists tell us that you can burn new neurological pathways over the old neurological pathways, and the new neurological pathways begin to define you in ways that the old neurological pathways no longer have control over you. So it's not that the old ones do not exist, it's that the new ones are stronger and they trumpet and they get over it, and you've got these new ones, so that when in the past I was being defined by the horizontal offenses against me, I now come and say, wait a minute, I am no longer defined by the horizontal things against me, I am now being redeemed by the vertical redemption that's been done to me. Do you hear what I'm saying? Forgiving each other as Christ, as Christ, as Christ has forgiven you, so you also must do. There's something about the cross. When I survey the wondrous cross, where on that horrible place where all of my sins were laid on him, when I, oh, what can wash away my sins? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. When we come to church, what is it about us when we're like, man, Mike, when I'm at church, I feel like I got a shot in the arm of hope. What is that? It's the same thing on Sunday that you can do on Tuesday. You can look at the same cross on Tuesday that you were thinking about on Sunday, and the same redemption available on Sundays, available on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. Because what you cannot demolish horizontally, you can get redeemed vertically. And that's what happens when you come and say, wait, the key to forgiveness, it is not forgetting what my grandfather did. It's remembering what my father did. The key to forgiveness is not forgetting about the atrocities of earth. It's remembering the redemption of heaven. The key to forgiveness is not trying to get over it and act like earth problems never happened. It's remembering, remembering, remembering that heaven says the last word. And when the king speaks, he doesn't stutter. That's the key to forgiveness. So when people say, I cannot forgive because I cannot forget, you do not need to forget. You need to remember. You just got to remember the right things because when you've only remembered Uncle Tim or what Terrence did or what your mother said or what the boss did or how the person that you so deeply trusted stabbed you in the back and you say, no one understands me, I say to you, there is one who knows treachery more than anyone else and I may not understand it and your person sitting next to you may not understand it, but there is one who knows what it's like to be stabbed and beaten and whipped and emotionally rejected. There is one who knows your pain like no one else and that is Jesus. And when you come to him, I'm telling you, the key to forgiveness, it is not forgetting. It's not acting like it didn't happen. There is wickedness that was done to some of you, and it is wrong, and these people will pay. But I'm telling you, you need to get free today, and you've got to stop wearing the snake that bit you. You've got to stop drinking the poison and thinking it's going to do it to them. This is the day today where you cut them loose, and you say, I let you go. I forgive you, not because I feel it. It's because I choose it. I choose to forgive you because Jesus forgave me, and then you go free. You know, I was reading this week, Emmanuel AME Church, 2015, having a Bible study, and a white supremacist walks in to a traditionally black church, and, and he acts like he's having a Bible study with him for about an hour, an hour, and he pulls out a gun, starts to mow people down, just sick, just evil, just wicked. It wasn't surprising that he got convicted and got the full measure of the law against him, that wasn't surprising. What was surprising that was at his hearing, the people in the church showed up. And they came and they were angry and they were hurt and they were weeping and they felt it and they did not deny their anger and they did not deny the pain, but they brought something that no one saw coming. 
when they told Dylan Roof, this wicked man, we forgive you. I mean, it was all over the Washington Post and Huffington Post and, and you know, all of the New York Times. I mean, every, everyone was there to watch these people, these saints of God, to have one woman say, you took my mother from me and I'll never get to talk to her. I'll never see her again. But I forgive you because I follow Jesus. And, and I read that and I'm like, that is impossible. Unless you've got Jesus. See, forgiveness is not denying the pain. One of the, one of the men in our church several years ago, 10 years ago-ish, his father was murdered. He just put this on YouTube. His father was murdered, drive-by shooting. And he hated this man because he had a great dad. Hated this man. Some of you have seen the video clip, but he ended up feeling like he had to forgive him. And so he forgave by choice, not by, not by feeling. He forgave him. He went to his trial, and he stood up, and, and the judge asked, he said, can I say something? And he gave his, gave his words of forgiveness to this man. He says, I forgive you, and may God have mercy on you. Anyway, long story short, it's, it's been 10 years, and this, this year, he, at Easter time, he was feeling like for several months, God was telling him to go find this man that had done this because he's been... He's been troubled by this for these last 10 years. I need some of you to know forgiveness is not a one-time thing. Sometimes you forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. Sometimes it didn't happen once and it was all done. And Don't be upset with yourself and say, well, maybe I didn't really forgive if I'm still feeling something. No, you could have truly forgiven, and it's going to be like layers of an onion. You're going to have to keep on forgiving. He felt like he wanted to find him. And long story short, you can hear his 25-minute testimony on YouTube, but we'll have a link to it. But, but he, he ends up hunting him down and trying to find him. And, and God basically arrested Ian Joshua Schnorr in, in, to, to go to this, to, to find him. He ends up in this prison face-to-face -face with this man that took his father's life, took him out of him. And, he, and he, he, he basically felt like the Lord told him, I leave the 99 to go after the one, and I want him. I want him to know. You know, he, he felt this for him. So he was going to go to bring total forgiveness forgiveness and, and preach the gospel to him. When he gets there in jail, he, to his surprise, on the other side of the glass was a man that was asking for forgiveness, as was a man who had come to know Jesus. And here was his story. He was a very wicked, evil man. He said, I'm so sorry to say I was so high on drugs. I don't even remember what happened that day, and I'm sure that doesn't feel good. But they, and he was terrible when he was in in jail, they would smuggle drugs in, and he would, you know, he was just a messed up guy, but he ended up in solitary confinement. And when he was in solitary confinement, as part of his punishment, the only thing they gave him were the transcripts of his hearing. And in his transcript of his hearing, Ian's testimony of, I forgive you, and Jesus will forgive you if you reach out. He's in solitary confinement with nothing but an epistle from his hearing from a Christian who said, I forgive you. And over the course of time, he ends up giving his life to Jesus. And now here he is, and Ian's given the testimony, and he's on the other side of glass where he realizes my tormentor is now my brother, and there is this restoration that has taken place, and it is incredible. See, when you forgive, you partner, you partner with heaven. This, this won't ever happen unless you know that God is going to work all things together for good. A few years, a couple years ago, my dad died, and... And just to be very transparent with you, when my, my, my you know, got raised by a single mom, my, my dad left when I was younger. All of my Christian life, I was waiting for my dad to repent. I was waiting, I wanted, my, I wanted to hear my dad say once, I'm sorry, or I, I regret that, or I shouldn't have left. I shouldn't have done that to your mom. I shouldn't have done that to the family. I should, I, and I, I never heard that. And, and I was always praying for that. I would, I would share the gospel, but I was holding out for that. And I remember on the day he died, I was sitting at hospice in the room with his dead body. And after about like 20 minutes of just sitting there looking at his dead body, I, I looked up at him and I'm like, I'm just talking to a body. And I'm like, you're, you're never going to, you're never, now it's never going to happen. You're never going to say you're sorry. You're never, I mean, part of this is I want my dad in heaven. The other, there, there's a part that's also like, especially to have heard so many times, no regrets, you know, no regrets. And, and he was, and I don't want to minimize, how he was a great dad in a lot of ways, but I, I, but I was just, just to have that unknown, I, 
And I was like, he got away. It's like he, he got away. And I'm like, and I felt there, there was something, even in the last few weeks, I just, I kept on thinking about my dad. And I'm like, man, I just, just to hear, I mean, just, by the way, any of you that need to say I'm sorry to someone, please go tell them. But something happened here recently because it, it hit, there's some parts, there's curses in my family and it seems like one generation to another, there's parts of me that have felt like I'm just destined to repeat the sins of my forefathers. And then something hit me. I am not defined by the curses of earth when I receive the redemption of heaven. As long as you think that your tormentors and your oppressors have power to stop God's plan and destiny on your life, you'll never forgive them. But when you understand that there is no weapon formed against you that can prosper, when you understand that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, when you understand that the former things are laid aside and that in God all things can become new, when you understand, as it says in Colossians chapter 2, and I love this very verse when it says in Colossians 2 verse 13 and you who were dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands he has, he has done something in us there's something that he's done he has made us alive together with him Jesus has done something in us that no one else could do. Do you understand that when you come to Jesus, there is a redemption? And when you understand that, you know, you know what, Dad, which I finally had to say it out loud, Dad, you're even dead now, but I forgive you. I will not hold this any longer. And there's some of you that need to do the same thing. Some of you need to say to the snake that bit you, I'm not going to wear you any longer. Some of you need to say to the curses that have afflicted you, you will not control me any longer because you've got the power today to set them free because God, because God is bigger. Jesus goes on a cross to translate you into the kingdom of light for his namesake. So here's how I'm gonna end it today. If you're in this place and you've never received forgiveness, this is your day to receive forgiveness. In about a minute, I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, if you know that you are not right with God and you need to be forgiven of your sins before God, I announce to you Jesus went on a cross to forgive you. Jesus went on a cross to pay for you. Jesus paid for your sins. Jesus paid for your sins. He was buried and he rose and he gives power. And there's a power that comes into you in about 30 seconds. I'm going to count to three. And when I say that, if you need Jesus to forgive you, call upon the Lord. If you need that mercy, this is your day to be free. This is your day to come clean. This is your day to come alive. If that is you, then I'm going to say to you, Christ has forgiven you. It's going to be just like that. If you need that in 15 seconds, I'm going to say three. And when I do, if you need the mercy and you're ready to say, Jesus, have mercy on me. Forgive me. And God's going to bring life into you. If that is you, get ready. One, here it comes. Do you need Jesus to forgive you? This is your day. Two, this is the day of salvation. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If that is you, now. Three, put your hand up if you need mercy and forgiveness. Yep, who else? Who else? Yep, good, good. Yes, yes, good. Put it, just leave it up for a second. Just put it up and leave it there. Good, 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 good. You can just kind of put it down. Say, Lord, yes, do this, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Have mercy on me. Is there anyone else? You'd say, Mike, I didn't raise my hand, but I want to. I want to get right with him today. I want that forgiveness. Yep, who else? Who else? Anyone else? All right, all of you that just raised your hand, good. All of you that just raised your hand, I want you to join me. I'm about to walk off the stage and I'm about to bow my knees because the scripture says every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. If you just raise your hand or you should have, I want you to come join me. Ready? Right now. Just, if, you, if you just raise your hand, just get up out of your seat. Come join me in this place and we're going to receive forgiveness of sins. Even if you're all the way in the back, you just come on down. We're just going to bow just like this. And we're going to be like that sinful woman that... He said, woman, your sins are forgiven. You're going to get off your knees and your sins are going to be forgiven. See, there's unilateral forgiveness. He forgave you 2,000 years ago on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them. But it becomes reconciliation when you repent. If you need to be up here, there's place for you. Come on. Come on, there's space for you. There's space for you. It's not too late for you. It's not too late for you. This is the day. This is the time. This is the time. Blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven. Anyone else, if you need to be here, man, we're, we're here for you. 
prayer team, I want to make sure everyone's got someone praying with them, a man with a man and a woman with a woman. Obviously, the bulk of this message has been a message of giving forgiveness. If you're in here and there's someone that you're holding something against, don't leave the room until you have exercised that forgiveness. Don't leave the room before you come with God and perhaps say, God, I release them to you. You're not letting them off the hook, you're letting them off your hook. Getting off your hook is not getting off the hook. You release them, you forgive that uncle, that grandfather, that father, that mother, that husband, that wife. Forgive them and you're gonna catch your breath. We're gonna have some people up here that if you would like some prayer to help you with this, we're gonna do that. So if some of our prayer team could just line up across the front, I need some more microchurch leaders and breakthrough servers and whatnot, just to be available to pray with people. If that would help you, we'd like to do that. You might be able to do it on your own. You might wanna just find a quiet spot. You might need to go outside and send a text, I don't know, but it starts usually with you and God, but, but do what God tells you to do. May the Lord lead you into that. Next week, Missionary Sam's gonna be here. It's gonna be incredible, talking about human trafficking and hearing what God's doing, but, but right now, before you leave, and we go out in food trucks, we're gonna have lunch and fun and all that kind of stuff. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may he give you the grace right now to bring healing in your soul in Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.